what is it in our humanity that leads us to want to make devices like chat GPT? <laughs> right, so in other words, there, there, there's something going on inside of us that has, has created this desire to create um, artificial intelligence. What does that tell us about who we are? And, and are we, should we see this as us expressing our humanity and trying to create artificial intelligence? Or are we somehow overstepping the bounds of what it means to be human, right, when we try to create things like artificial intelligence? You're looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there is something that we create naturally as human beings. And it's not artificial intelligence, but it's language. Right? So human communities, if you set human children free, apparently they'll develop a language to talk to each other. And this has happened where people don't have a common language. They develop and independently develop a new language. So I, I do think that there's something intrinsic about our capacity for language manipulation, creating these tools that enables us to think in a certain way. I'm not sure if the computer instantiated tools could simply be considered an extension of our capacity for language. But. Yeah, so I'd say that in these discussions, I think it's really important to keep in mind that artificial intelligence is a very broad idea. So uh, most of the stuff that I've worked with, if not all of it, actually all of it, I have no, I mean, I have no question about it. It's not sentient. It doesn't have language abilities or anything. It, it, it really is just a program. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and there's so many different applications. I mean, we found out, uh, you know, just like last month, we found out that the military has actually been putting AI into control F-15s and doing dogfights, and it can actually outperform you know, humans in dogfights. That's like a very different thing. I don't think it's sentient either, and do we really want it to have control of a weapon system? So they actually have like a human <laughs> who's there who, who has to actually pull the trigger, right? Um, the reason I'm pointing that out is that, you know, there's going to be a whole set of questions about having AI controlling a fighter jet that do not apply to having AI help design a drug or help make, and a different set of questions about helping make a diagnosis or treat a patient and a different set that are involving in like, you know, issuing a loan application or a prison sentence or, and, and it can go very wrong in all of these places. It can also go really, really well. Um, and so I, I don't think we want to think about it broadly as like, why do, I mean, why do we make AI broadly? So I think the first thing is I think the reason why we do all these things is we think it could be helpful. And we just kind of want to do things that are useful in this world. I think that's the main reason why we do it. Now, beyond that, this question of why would we even want to make a general intelligence that could actually be another person? That's a separate question, I would say. And, um, and that's important because there was actually a great deal of debate in the field about whether or not even we should be doing these large language models because they take an immense amount of resources it cost hmm. about, um, it costs several million dollars to train ChatGPT. Um, and the next version is gonna require, I mean, you can bet that there's millions and millions of dollars that will be invested in the next version of it. Mm -hmm. uh, tens of millions of dollars is my guess in terms of like training this thing because of now it actually has commercial success. Um, and so people wondered about that or whether it made more sense to do smaller things kind of focused on tasks. Um, and then we can look at movies, which is like in science fiction is really wonderful. Everyone likes science fiction, right? Mm -hmm. We do see this kind of common, like reoccurring impulse, this idea that we have of actually making other beings, right? That are in our image, but different. Um, so that does seem to be kind of something that just comes up frequently. And I think we're troubled by it too. On one hand, we want to. On the other hand, we know that there might be issues with it. We're kind of working out what that means, right? And what's so interesting, I think, about that discourse and how important that's been in the science fiction world and, and in philosophy and other places mm -hmm. is how we've had no tools in which to do it, yet we were so preoccupied and wondering about this. <laughs> that tells us something about who we are. Mm -hmm. um, it tells us uh, that, that, is, that, that kind of procreative aspect, that beyond just merely biological procreation, is kind of there, and yet we're also troubled by it. We know that, that there is... We know that we can't be trusted with that power. <laughs> <laughs> we know we have that. We know we want the power and that we can't be trusted with it all the same. And isn't that a big part of what it means to be human? <laughs> well, we have this power already, though, right? We have this power with which we can't really be trusted. 
uh, in all sorts of contexts. We have the power to destroy all sorts of things. And when I read Lemoyne's, you know, you, you quoted Lemoyne's um, that's, essay. A, that's the Google engineer who thought right. of it, yeah. He's worried about the possibility that what he considers to be an agent, agentified AI could, could perpetrate all sorts of uh, dastardly things on us. And I think it's not, I mean, I, I, I share that worry. I don't share his view that this is uh, a conscious entity that's going to you know, actively seek our, our demise. But I am worried about its capability to in, enter our lives and interfere with all sorts of things that we naturally do. And it already has tremendously significant power. Well, so in terms of interfering with our lives, AI is already totally interfering, mm -hmm. but it's not a conscious AI. So mm -hmm. I think, in this sense, I think the analogy is better to a lot of technology. Computers, and you're, you know, you're, how many people here have a smartphone? <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone not have a smartphone? <laughs> One person in the back, <laughs> you're trying to make a point with your life, aren't you? <laughs> um, so, like, let's be honest, like, we all, almost everyone here is old enough to remember the time before they had a, a smartphone, right? The way your mind works now is quite different, right? Mm. And some pretty profound and, dare I say, even personal ways that are very visible to you, but probably not very visible to people on the outside. It's a, it's a very much a life-altering thing that we can't even really live without. And not only that, like the crazy guy in the back there in the room, you're even doubtful <laughs> if it's true. He's, just, he's, like, he's, like, he's fasting from it for Lent. <laughs> It'll be back. <laughs> He'll eventually, if that's what you're thinking, right? That's, how fun, that's what technology does. Is it, it, it starts out as something useful, but it usually ends up so altering the human experience that it's become something that we can't really conceive of living without. And, and this has become kind of well known to philosophers of technology for quite some time. Like Heidegger wrote about this. And, and, it, and like, you know, it does really reshape the world, technology, and particularly a lot of this computer stuff that we're around. And I'm telling you, AI is invading in places you just don't even know it's doing things. Mm -hmm. And it's reshaping things in ways that you don't even see, um, but it's there in a big way to the point where it changes the nature of reality and it changes the nature of who we are. Um, and so, uh, so is that good or bad? Well, so progress um, is a complicated thing. Um, so I'm a Christian and I do think there's this duality that we face and I think at least some of the key themes in, in scripture really I think do give a good framework for thinking about this. Um, I, th I, th I, think, I think one of the things that scripture really calls into question is the goodness of progress. Not to say that progress couldn't be good, but the progress as we get it actually might be far more fallen than we might expect. It could actually be far better than what it is now. Like, technology's power, we are called to wield power, but we do not wield power well. <laughs> and we create worlds that, um, that could be far better than the worlds that we actually do create. I think that's like the grand narrative of scripture, and I think that, that just we see that over and over again. And I think for us to be good and not merely progressing, we have to think about what good progress can be. So that's, that's, that's a really interesting insight. So, so if I'm understanding right, your, your point is first that artificial intelligence is a much broader term than just the sorts of entities that might seem to be mistakable for a human being, right? Mm -hmm. so, there's, there's all kinds of things we could imagine artificial intelligence doing. And so one question would be, how do we feel about some of these other uses of artificial intelligence, which might be motivated simply to, by our desire to make the world a better place somehow? Mm -hmm. You know, if we're able to design better medical treatments, you know, you're, you're a doctor, we're trying to figure out ways that artificial intelligence may be able to help us improve human health, right? That seems like um, a laudable thing. Um, we start to become more uncomfortable when we start trying to uh, imagine ourselves creating things that seem uh, too much like us, right? And there's, there's a new set of concerns people have. Um, but, but your last statement is, I think, causing us to think a little bit about what the relationship is between technological progress and human flourishing. Right? So in other words, we might have an idea that obviously the more technology we have and the more powerful it is, clearly the more we human beings are going to flourish because we're going to be able to do things with the technology that we were unable to do without it. Right? So that would lead us to have this kind of assumption of goodness right, um, from technology. 
But to use your example of smartphones, I mean, one of the things many of us, I think, can relate to is uh, as, I've, as I've watched our society adapt to the smartphone, on balance, I don't think it's made us happier people. Um, I think it's actually probably made us less happy people uh, than we were before the technology, even as it's very difficult for us to imagine giving it up, right? And so there, there, there's this worry sometimes that as human beings, we have, oh, maybe we can frame it this way. You know, I, I asked, like, what does our desire to create artificial intelligence say about us as human beings? Um, for both of you, what, what, if, what if somebody put forward the idea, maybe as human beings, we have this tendency to think there's a technological solution to our deepest problems when really those problems can't be solved with a technological solution, right? So we keep chasing after mm -hmm. technology with AI now being the most powerful one. Uh, but we may find ourselves continually disappointed with its ability to actually deliver on the promise of helping us flourish. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, if you look at the history of thought, I mean, I think um, technology always comes with very high promises, and, and and it has objectively made certain aspects of life objectively better. So I'm not trying, I'm not anti-technology. I mean, I, I'm, I'm developing this technology. I, I, I have a smartphone too. <laughs> so it's not that I'm not, I'm not I'm not a luddite. I'm not trying to be against it. Um, I mean, and this also once again, I, it, it is interesting to me that you know. The, the biblical narrative starts at the garden, um, and then you kind of immediately kind of thrust into agriculture and then the rise of civilization, like you see like the invention of swords and things like that, um, like the rise of warfare. But it doesn't end in a garden per se, it ends actually in a city, <laughs> in a redeemed city. So it's not so much that I think the answer is that there should not be progress, it's rather that we should have progress, but we should realize that that there is often a very hellish side to the process, <laughs> to, to like the progress we have. That, that, that's contingent, it wasn't necessary. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could have been done differently, it could have been better. Mm -hmm. And what we have to kind of imagine and hope for and pray for and like long for and sacrifice for is that possibility of a better city, a better sort of progress, uh, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not so much a return to innocence and a return to like, you know, being hunters and gatherers as a solution. But rather, um, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, like the, in, you know, kind of like in the in like Martin Luther King's language, mm -hmm. like you know, how do we kind of usher forth the kingdom of God? <laughs> and that, that's a kingdom of God that's not a garden; it's actually a city. It's a city with people in it. It's a place of a progress, but it's a progress that that didn't take the wrong turns to have those those broken things, but actually might have actually done some things that actually are beneficial for everyone, not just some of us.